Today's video is kindly supported by Rise of Kingdoms. Hey, 42 here. On the evening of January the 16th, 1920, the streets of New York witnessed a funeral unlike any other. Crowds of people descended upon restaurants, hotels, cafes, and bars to pay their respects and share their sorrows. Rooms across the city were decorated with black tablecloths and painted walls. Orchestras played funeral marches set to jazz time, and weeping mourners raised their glasses one last time to toast the departed. The following morning, the New York Times published a eulogy with the resonating headline, John Barleycorn died peacefully at the toll of 12. The fact that his death provoked such a grand response was rather odd, given that he never actually existed in the flesh. Rise of Kingdoms is a multi-civilization mobile strategy game that combines real-time strategy gameplay. After launching almost three years ago now, it has over 60 million players worldwide. Within Rise of Kingdoms, you have the option to choose between any of 12 civilizations that have actually appeared throughout history. Like a traditional strategy game, you're able to collect resources in order to build your own city, upgrade your buildings, train your soldiers, cultivate your commanders, and research technology to improve your combat power. And you are able to choose the Viking civilization now, with their legendary leaders Ragnar Lothbrok and Bjorn Ironside. You will lead the Viking warriors all the way from the Loire River in a bid to conquer the world. One of the best things about the game is the scale of the map. With over 1.44 million digital square meters, it will take some exploring. And I love that the game has real mornings and evenings, as well as real terrain. Rise of Kingdoms is free to download and free to play. Click on the link in the description box below to download the game now. Use code ROKVIKINGS in-game. Best of all, you also have the chance to win an iPhone 12 Pro Max, iPhone 12 Pro or iPhone 12, and a lot of in-game resources. All you need to do is click on the second link in the description. You see, John Barleycorn was more of a symbol. His character, taken from a pagan folk song, was meant to be the personification of whiskey and beer and his demise had been a long time coming. Exactly a year before this fictitious funeral took place, the 18th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors anywhere within the United States. And although President Woodrow Wilson tried to veto it, Congress succeeded in pushing through the Volstead Act, named after Andrew Volstead, a Minnesota politician who championed the new legislation in between grooming his formidable mustache. My god, that's a mustache if ever I saw one. Anyway, this change was met with funerals of a very different kind across America's Bible Belt. One particularly raucous celebration took place in Virginia and was hosted by Billy Sunday, a professional baseball player turned evangelical preacher. Billy had never been a fan of the so-called John Barleycorn, to put it mildly. In fact, he saw the Volstead Act as a victory over Satan himself. To really drive his point home, he hired someone to dress up as Satan, follow a group of pallbearers carrying a coffin to the church, and sit down to watch the proceedings with a face like a smacked ass and to show his guests exactly what they wouldn't be missing in the future, Billy even hired people to pretend to be completely pished and harass guests with inarticulate insults. It's fair to say he really got into the spirit of things. But questionable hosting skills aside, Billy was far from alone in his enthusiasm for the long dry spell. In fact, the groundwork for national abstinence was laid down more than a century before his booze-free bash. In the early 1800s, heavy drinking was the norm, with the average American man drinking up to 12 gallons of alcohol a year. That's around 20 shots each week. Considering the average annual consumption of the modern American is just 2.3 gallons, 
That's pretty impressive. And so many towns and cities resembled a perpetual freshers' week. Many were disgusted by what they saw, and so a fierce sentiment against alcohol began to emerge across the nation. Political figureheads started to point the finger at alcohol for all of society's ills. Gout, liver problems, madness, violence, promiscuity, and pretty much anything else considered a sin. People began to abstain from alcohol voluntarily and persuaded others to do the same, resulting in a widespread temperance movement. The movement was especially popular amongst women, who orchestrated sit-ins and protests in saloons and distilleries. Some temperance groups managed to stop alcohol sales altogether in parts of the Midwest and West. And even industrialist businessmen like Henry Ford got on board in the hope it would make his factories safer and his workers more productive. As the temperance movement gained momentum, the Anti-Saloon League emerged, led by a man named Wayne Wheeler. Wayne had always disliked alcohol, ever since a drunk farmhand accidentally stabbed his foot with a pitchfork when he was a child. From that point on, he made it his life's mission to put a stop to drunken antics once and for all, and became the most successful political lobbyist in America. It was said that he could handpick senators and make or break presidents. He even schmoozed with the KKK, who were in favour of the movement, and stirred tensions between rural white Americans and increasing number of immigrants bringing in whiskey, beer, and wine. He claimed that these drinks were weakening the nation's moral fibre, and that prohibition was synonymous with patriotism. I always thought it was eagles and guns, but perhaps I'm mistaken. The issue divided North America religiously, socially, and politically. Those who supported prohibition became known as the Dries, and were mainly made up of Protestant Republicans who lived in rural areas, whereas the Wets tended to be Democrats, city dwellers, and Catholic immigrants. On November the 11th, 1918, the armistice ending World War I was signed, and an intoxicating mixture of victory and anti-immigrant sentiment permeated the air. The Dries rode that momentum, and a few weeks later, the 18th Amendment became law. And the penalties for breaking that law were substantial. You could be fined up to $10,000, a ridiculously large sum back then, and sentenced to a full year in prison. Because of this, the police didn't anticipate too much trouble in enforcing it. But boy, were they wrong. Like any law, there were loopholes, and the Wets managed to exploit these loopholes with admiral creativity. The law forbade the transport and purchase of alcohol, but it was still permitted for medicinal purposes. So, it'll come as no surprise that 1920 saw a sudden surge in alcohol prescriptions. 8 million gallons of the stuff, to be precise, which is enough to fill 64 million pint glasses. Back then, alcohol was used to cure anything from cholera to cancer. So, if you suddenly felt like you had a disease or infection that only alcohol could cure, you could just pop right along to your local doctor, get a prescription, and order your beverage of choice at the pharmacy. Alcohol also began to take on some inconspicuous disguises. You might find it inside a watermelon, or an egg, underneath a nun's habit, or tucked inside a pram which, to be fair, you can still see on certain streets in Britain today. There is even a fake book, not so subtly titled, Spring Poems, The Four Swallows, which contained four glass vials. Get it? One of the most popular methods was to hollow cane, which you can still buy today if you want to be more of a gentlemanly alcoholic. Californian wineries sold dried raisin cakes, which were labelled with a very helpful warning to consumers that if you fermented them, they just so happened to turn into delicious wine. Oh my! 
What a coincidence. But the reward for the most elaborate masquerade goes to those who dressed up as priests, transformed their homes into churches, and had their mates around for a casual congregation, all in an effort to get hold of some sacramental wine. If you didn't fancy faking cholera, carving out an egg, or staging a full sermon with all the trimmings in your kitchen, another option was to hunt down and gain entry to a speakeasy. If you had the right password, that is. Speakeasies were private, unlicensed bar rooms, and prohibitions worst kept secret. There were literally thousands of them, ranging from basement dives to high-end ballrooms, and they were hugely popular. For the first time in America's history, men and women were able to drink together in public, and the nation shimmied into the jazz-fueled, liquor-infused party known as the Roaring Twenties. It wasn't illegal to drink in speakeasies. Remember, the law forbade the manufacture, distribution, and sale of alcohol, but not the consumption of it. The owners of said establishments, however, were very much breaking the law, and premises were raided on a daily basis. In the early days, the tactics used to avoid a night in the cells were rudimentary at best. Owners would fight back at the police with anything they had to hand, cooking equipment, cutlery, crockery. One officer was even knocked out cold with a rolling pin. Thankfully, others were happy to look the other way in return for a drink on the house. But as prohibition continued, speakeasies became a lucrative business, and with a little more cash to spend, owners began to create Bond villain-worthy contraptions. At the 21 Club in New York, for instance, they installed a camouflage door, a false wall to hide a secret wine cellar, and even a button behind the bar that, if pushed, would drop all the bottles down to the cellar to crash open and drain out. How were the owners getting hold of alcohol in the first place, if the wineries and breweries were no longer in business? Well. Although the government had put a stop to the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, they couldn't do anything about the production of industrial alcohol, unless they also happened to ban essentials like paint, cleaning products, and gasoline. But they never expected those products to be an issue. Since 1906, industrial alcohol was denatured with unpleasant chemicals to prevent people from drinking it and thus circumvent the higher tax levied on regular consumer alcohol. Imagine drinking lighter fluid, and you'll appreciate why, up to now, it had proved incredibly effective. But desperate times call for desperate measures, literally. And so, moonshiners grabbed their lab coats, flasks, and Bunsen burners redistilled industrial alcohol and created something that was more or less drinkable. And if you feel like having a go yourself, here's how to make a prohibition classic, bathtub gin. And when I say have a go, what I actually mean is never try this at home and please don't sue me. First, take the cheapest alcohol you can find and pour it into a huge jar. If you can get your hands on some denatured alcohol, Great, but be warned that it might cause a mild case of death. Now for some flavour. For a no-nonsense gin, a handful of juniper berries will do. But if you're feeling a little fancy, add a sprinkling of orange or lemon peel. Next, fill it with water. Your jar should be too large to fill from a sink, so for a truly authentic experience, fill it from the bathtub. Cover the jar, store it in a cool, dark place for a few days, pass the gin for a strainer, and finally, add the strongest mixer available to disguise the unbearable flavour. This kind of drink was often made at home late at night, hence the term moonshine. But it also took on a much larger scale. Bigger stills could produce five gallons of alcohol in only eight minutes, with commercial, albeit underground, stills pumping out 50 to 100 gallons a day. The bootleggers would sell it onto speakeasies for a tidy profit. And the result of all this madness? 
a rapid surge in organized crime as gangsters fought to control the lucrative moonshine trade. Of all the bootleggers who made it big during the Prohibition, the most infamous by far was Al Capone, who supplied huge quantities of alcohol and ran gambling, prostitution and other rackets in Chicago throughout the 20s. He used bribery and intimidation to control city officials, put gunmen on the roofs of polling stations to make sure his favourite politicians were elected, and orchestrated the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where he ordered the murder of seven of his rivals. So to say that the plans to create a more pious nation had backfired would be an understatement. In addition to organised crime, people were accepting bribes left, right and centre, and the number of drinking establishments had more than doubled since Prohibition began. The government had greatly underestimated people's sheer determination to get utterly trolleyed. They needed a better plan, and fast, before the country further descended into anarchy. But nobody could have foreseen the lengths they would go to in order to achieve it. On Christmas Eve 1926, a man stumbled into a New York hospital emergency room, flushed and trembling with fear. Santa Claus, he told the nurses, was just behind him, equipped with a baseball bat. Before anyone realised how sick he was, he died, followed by another 64 deaths by the end of Christmas Day. Doctors found that all 65 deaths had been caused by highly toxic additives in industrial alcohol. Additives that had been authorised by the federal government. In a drastic attempt to limit the supply of alcohol at its source, the government had underhandedly authorised poisonous methanol, also known as wood alcohol, to be added to any products that contained industrial alcohol. Methanol is extremely dangerous because when your body digests it, it breaks down into some uniquely poisonous compounds which cause dementia and ultimately death. This resulted in an ongoing showdown between the federal chemists who were trying to make industrial alcohol deadlier to drink and the bootleggers chemists who had found that they could evaporate most of the poison by boiling it and for a while, it seemed as though the bootleggers were winning. The government attempted formula after formula, but the rogue chemists continued to renature it. By 1926, 750 New York citizens had died from government authorised poisons, and many had suffered from irreversible injuries, such as paralysis and blindness. Yes, people were literally becoming blind drunk. Then, on the 1st of January 1927, Congress announced new legislation requiring double the amount of methanol to be added to industrial alcohol products, which proved impossible to completely filter out. The result was catastrophic. One government report claimed that a 480,000 gallons of liquor confiscated in New York in 1927, nearly all contained poison. The bootleggers, as expected, had continued to sell the treated alcohol, and it's estimated that more than 10,000 people across the states died as a result. And whilst we're pretty sure today that the government did take these steps to prevent people from breaking the law, it raises some awkward questions about the human sacrifices they were willing to make for those gains. Did they authorise the addition of poisons, knowing that people would sell and drink the alcohol anyway? The facts suggest that at least some of them did. The Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Seymour Lohman, openly told citizens that drinkers were dying off fast from poison hooch. But if it meant a sober America, it was a job well done, as far as some were concerned. And Wayne Wheeler, remember him? Leader of the Anti-Saloon League, evil mastermind, unfortunate incident with a pitchfork, yeah, now you got it. Well, he justified it by claiming that anyone who drank industrial alcohol was committing suicide, and that rooting out a bad habit 
costs lives. Whether the government deliberately intended to poison American citizens or not, they had already lost their trust, partly due to their own hypocrisies throughout Prohibition. President Warren Harding, who had campaigned as a dry, was known for throwing huge Gatsby-esque parties that were famous throughout Washington. And even in the Capitol building, there was a secret bar hidden within a curtain, which was supplied by, yep, you guessed it, confiscated alcohol. Prohibition officially ended with the ratification of the 21st Amendment in 1933. But by that point, it was really just a formality. Whilst organised crime had flourished, tax revenues had depleted, and as the 30s ushered in the Great Depression, the government realised that they needed the tax money from alcohol sales more than they wanted sobriety. But many of Prohibition's legacies live on today. Classic cocktails such as The Old Fashioned, The Bee's Knees and Sidecar all made their debut during Prohibition in an attempt to disguise the foul tasting liquor. And you can still find modern speakeasies around the world which attempt to recreate that alluring feeling of going underground and crossing the line of the law. These days, police are less likely to turn up, but just in case they do, it's always worth taking a rolling pin for good measure. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Rise of Kingdoms for supporting this video. Are you ready to build your kingdom using 12 historically accurate civilizations? Then go ahead and click the link in the description and use code ROKVIKINGS to play today. And don't forget to click the second link in the description to enter the contest to win an iPhone 12 Pro Max, iPhone 12 Pro, or iPhone 12, and lots of in-game resources. Check it out.